Hello, everybody, and welcome to Commodity Culture, where we break down the commodity space for both new and experienced investors. Before we get started, standard disclaimer, nothing here is investment advice. Do your own due diligence. And today we have a fan favorite returning to the show, one of the most respected analysts in the silver and gold space, and the president and CEO of Miles Franklin Precious Metals. It's Andy Sheckman. Great to have you back on. Good to see you too, Jesse. It's been uh, it's been a minute, and uh, I always love our discussions, whether they're this way over a Zoom call, as we've all become accustomed to, or even better when I get to to see you in person in Vancouver. And of course, I'll be looking forward to seeing you there again in a couple of months. Crazy to say that a couple of months is already winter time, but damn, man, the the time just flies lately. I don't know if you noticed that. Maybe it's just that I get older. My dad always had this this uh, analogy he says life's like a roll of toilet paper you know when you're young you don't notice it's spinning but as you get older it spins faster and you start to see the cardboard a little a little bit more clearly and uh, i don't know if that's happened to you too but over the last three four years man it's like a blur it's just like a blur so anyway sorry to ramble but it's great to see you. it's good to be back and i uh, hope you're doing well yeah great to have you back on and definitely agree with that analogy there um and it was great seeing you in Vancouver last time, and we will definitely do another interview live uh, next year in January, 21st and 22nd. So that, that's going to be happening. So really looking forward to that. But for now, I want to discuss gold with you to start, and then we'll dive into silver later. So let's begin with the 30,000-foot overview of the gold sector from your perspective. What are the main tailwinds and catalysts that you currently see working in gold's favor and on the other side of the coin, are there any headwinds or risks you see for the sector, either short or longer term? Well, I, you know, look, short term in anything to me is noise. Uh, and, and maybe that's an unfair characteristic, Jesse, but to me, it is noise. I, I have always been of the mindset of looking at things from a macro perspective. And I think when you focus on the rustling leaves of the trees and ignore the forest, you make a mistake. And I think that that's really the big picture here. I think we can draw an analogy between a, a country like China versus one like the United States. We think in terms of minutes and hours and days and weeks, and they think in terms of years and decades and centuries. And, you know, I think from a macro perspective, the case for gold has never been stronger uh, on every single level. You know, when I look at several criteria that makes me say that, you have the Bank of International Settlements reclassifying it as a tier one asset. The only other one next to U.S. dollars and treasuries as far as central banks are concerned. You have a massive drive to repatriate gold by the central banks from the centers of, of deposit, namely the uh, United States um, Fed, the New York Fed, uh, or the Bank of England, where metals have been held uh, for quite some time. And we've seen this drive to repatriate for some years now, the Bundesbank starting the, the push, but the, the Dutch National Bank and, and the Czech National Bank and the Bank of Austria, Poland, Hungary, you know, they're all repatriating their gold on top of accumulating gold. And when you talk about the central banks who over the last 15, 18 months have bought more gold than at any time in their history, I look at them not only as the most well-funded banks, of course, or entities rather, of course, that's relevant and important, but I also look at them as the most well-informed and that's more important. They know the playbook and, you know, it's kind of like, um, NFL football game, when it's pouring rain out, they say, actually, passing attack in the, in the pouring rain is better than running because the quarterback and the receiver know where the, the play is going. The defense has to react on a wet field. Bad analogy, but I guess, I hope you get my point, and that is the central banks know where to go on the wet field in front of us, and they know the playbook. And I think when you see the most well-informed on top of well-funded, sophisticated investors on the planet buying more gold than in any time in history, it betrays the price, it betrays the rhetoric. But flipping that around, that's exactly what they're using, the, 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 the um, uh, price that is so counterintuitive, the rhetoric that is so 
anti-gold by the establishment to run cover for their for their acquisition, their methodical uh, acquisition that is showing itself in the bleeding down of inventory from not only places like the COMEX and the LBMA, but also the Shanghai Gold Exchange, the Shanghai Futures Exchange, and backdooring it out of the ETFs in a way that is very opaque. What we are seeing right now is a systematic bleed down of inventory across the globe by the most well-informed and well-funded traders on the planet. And that betrays the poor performance, and I say poor, maybe that's the wrong word. It isn't poor, it's done well, it's counterintuitive. I mean, people would think, should think, in the environment that we find ourselves in, you know, 40 year high inflation recently, geopolitical and political upheaval, the BRICS, all of these things, we would expect gold to be much higher, and it will be, but it is the suppression of the paper market that the West is clinging to, to make their system and the bond market and the system seem stronger than it really is. And the East and their foes are sitting there saying, great, suppress the price. We'll stand for delivery. We don't care. And that is when things will change as we get to the point where I would say you can only suppress a market or manipulate a market for an extended period of time by pushing it in the direction that it is going. And when you realize that for the first time in my 33 year career, the last few years, we have seen a global drive towards accumulation of precious metals of de-dollarization, a trend that bucks the trend that I've worked and lived through my whole career. That is of dollar supremacy. That is of, of, of U.S securities and bonds being the preferred choice of the world. And one has to wonder when you see countries like Japan and China and Saudi Arabia dump bonds to where Saudi Arabia is holding the lowest number of bonds, U.S. Treasuries that they've held in over six years, uh, and China and Japan on a methodical dumping spree of our treasuries, not rolling them over, cashing them out. At what point are we in this cycle where the U.S. assets and the U.S. Um, investments are losing their luster. So, yes, I think that from a 30,000-foot perspective, Jesse, I'm incredibly bullish on gold and silver. But by the same token, I understand the frustration that people watching this video may have and saying, well, why the hell isn't it going up the way it should? And I guess, and I know this is a longer question than you had bargained for. I'll answer it one other way. I believe in the term logarithmic decay. In fact, it, it, it comes into focus on so many things that I talk about. I'm sure in our discussion today, I'll bring it up again. But logarithmic decay, you could think of as the Niagara Falls, where you might be 20 miles upstream and have no idea that, there's a, that there are falls in front of you. And you're on a raft, and little by little, the pitch starts to decrease. Little by little, by little, by little, by little, by little, by little. And you hear something up in the horizon. What the hell is that rumbling? What's that noise? Little by little, by little, by little, by little, and bang, all at once. Now, where, where are we on this curve of logarithmic decay? And the same thing could be said for if you invert it and talk about where are we in terms of gold accumulation or dollar divestment. The bottom line is, is that when you're on the river upstream miles before the, the falls, you may not see things as clearly as, as uh, you would expect to. And I think that's where we are right now in the gold market, that most people don't see things as clearly as perhaps the central banks and the commercial banks do, who are accumulating copious amounts on every bit of weakness they see. So... I think you got to hang on tight, have strong fingertips, trust your gut. We're a long way from this being, you know, the, the final chapter being written. And uh, I am not dissuaded one bit by the performance that, again, is somewhat counterintuitive. I think we're just beginning on what will be a, um, uh, a much, much, much higher price in both gold and silver before the music stops. Well, I want to shift to the recent BRICS summit because what we've spoken about in our last interview was the potential for a BRICS gold-backed currency. But prior to the summit, the Russian embassy in Kenya tweeted out that there was going to be a gold-backed currency created by BRICS. I think that 
caused a lot of speculation to swirl online. A lot of people believe there was going to be an official announcement at this summit, and there was no official announcement of a new currency, but there were six new countries invited to join the BRICS nations and mention of a goal to move away from the dollar for international trade. So what are your thoughts on what transpired at the summit? Do you think eventually a gold-backed currency will be announced or a currency backed by commodities? I know for a lot of people, <clears throat> the, the results of the BRICS meeting were disappointing. And, you know, I um, had a couple of drinks with Jim Rickards a month or two ago before the meeting and talked to him about a lot of these things. You know, James is one of the smartest guys in the world. And um, for those who, who don't know who he is, I'm sure most do. Best-selling author, uh, was uh, hired as a consultant to the CIA to, to simulate financial war games. How could we be beaten by an opponent without... Uh, uh, firing a missile um, financially. And, you know, he did something that I have never had the courage to do. And I said this publicly in most of my interviews leading up to the summit, saying I respect Jim a lot and I agree with what he is saying, but he has more courage than I do to go out on a limb and say a date. Again, as we said earlier in the interview, I think in terms of macro perspective, big picture probabilities, and the probability of there being a gold-backed currency has never been stronger. It will happen, in my opinion. It didn't happen August 22nd, like he said. And I think there was some disappointment. He said something else that I took even more, and I said this in my inner or my presentation at the Rules Symposium, that I took more from, more away from than, than the fact that he was calling for a gold-backed currency to be issued August 22nd. But as far as that's concerned, first and foremost, the Russian finance minister has told us for two years, this is going to happen. And I believe it is. In fact, at the end of the meeting, the finance ministers of these countries were told to go back to the drawing board and come back and present their findings next year at the summit on a common settlement currency that is presumed to be pegged by commodities and or gold and distributed ledger technology backing it. I think that'll happen. But let's shelve that for a moment. The bigger um, topic that I took away from what James said, and again, he said it would come out on the 22nd, and he was wrong with that, but he won't be wrong in the future. I do not think this diminishes his, his credibility at all. In fact, I think he's right. It's just the timing is going to be wrong, and that's why I like to think in terms of probabilities in terms of eventualities and the likelihood of them happening. So one of the things that he talked about is something that I've talked about probably with you. Uh, for the past four years nearly, I've done over 1,200 videos on this topic. And it's been something that I've been very proud about talking about before just about anybody. And one of the things that I noticed along the way, although I never put them in uh, saying they're going to combine, I just inferred it is the combination of the Shanghai Cooperation Organization and the Eurasian Economic Union. Now, I have talked about four entities in all my videos because of the systemic connection between them all. They're all intertwined, and that would be the BRICS, the Belt Road Initiative, the Shanghai Cooperation Organization, and the Eurasian Economic Union. And when you talk about, for example, the Belt Road Initiative, it's the largest infrastructure project in human history. We've talked about this before. Over 150 countries, over 75% of human population, roughly 50% of global GDP. Um, it's the largest infrastructure project ever happened. And the most glaring thing to me on the Belt Road is that every one of the OPEC countries including those in South America, are on the Belt Road Initiative. The Shanghai Cooperation Organization is the largest regional military and financial organization in the world. You got the Chinese army backing it. Um, and then you have the Eurasian Economic Union. And these groups have a large amount of commingling, intertwining. Uh, Russia is a member of all of them. Saudi Arabia, as an example, has been admitted to BRICS, has 
formally applied to the Shanghai Cooperation Organization, is on the Belt Road Initiative, told the folks at Davos that they would be willing to take other currencies and has also formally applied to the BRICS New Development Bank. You can see how little pieces in and of themselves are not as significant as they are when you put them all together. And James said that these groups would um, form an alliance on August 22nd. They didn't, but wait. You know, Iran, in the span of one year, this country that we think that we have the ability to sanction, it is these sanctions and this, this, um, this, this, this way of, of going around the world and, and doing things under coercion, um, where we feel that we are the policemen of the world, right or wrong, the rest of the world doesn't like this. And I don't blame them. They look at us as being hypocritical, where we can go into to, um, Iraq and blow up their entire country under the guise of weapons of mass destruction and say, oops, sorry, didn't find any, but um, hey, you know, we're sorry. Well, Iraq just made trading in dollars illegal, by the way. If you own a company, you go to, into prison for trading in dollars and lose your business. So it's that coercion, that hypocrisy, the sanctioning, the confiscation of forex assets, all of these things that are creating this, this the drive to this cohesiveness amongst these countries. But in the span of one year, look what Iran has done. They've been formally admitted into the BRICS and formally admitted into the Shanghai Cooperation Organization. Uh, do you think they're worried about U.S. sanctions right now? I don't. And so when you talk about these groups coming together, that was the most important thing that I took away from what James was talking about, I believe we will see a gold-backed currency, no question about it to me. Um, and I believe that we will see these groups combine. In fact, just the other day, the president of Belarus is now proposing to hold a joint summit between the BRICS 11, that being BRICS plus the new six countries, the Shanghai Cooperation Organization, and the Eurasian Economic Union. And the president's vision for convergence of, of these multilateral organizations into the BRICS, uh, which would you know become the mother of all um, of all multipolarity organizations. So I take that away and say this is coming every bit the same way the gold back currency is coming. In fact, we found recently that Russia and Ty uh, and Iran are considering the use of a gold-backed Persian Gulf token or a stable coin um, for, for trade in oil. Uh, we've heard that the Shanghai Cooperation Organization wants to issue a gold-backed settlement currency for the entire Eurasian continent. We know that the BRICS are thinking very strongly about issuing a currency pegged to gold. And, and in my discussions with Mr. Rickards, he said something to me very, 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 very interesting. And he said it publicly, so I don't think it's a problem in me saying it to you here now. I said to him, Jim, here's my take on, on what's going to happen. I said, they're going to issue a gold-backed currency, and, and it, um, it won't be redeemable or convertible because President de Gaulle from France proved that convertible currencies convert. But what will happen, I said, is I think that it will be pegged to the technology behind the digital yuan. They will use, and that's a, a, a digital yuan, which has done 40, 50 billion in, in settlements, settling the contracts on the, on the Belt Road Initiative and, and, and first being rolled out at the Beijing Winter Olympics. So it's got, it's got a beta test underneath it to the nth degree. It works. I said, I think that that's what they will do. They will peg a new, a new uh, reserve or a new settlement currency, rather, at, to, to gold or to commodities, and they'll use distributed technology, distributed ledger technology to show the veracity and the immutability of it. That way, it doesn't need to be redeemable as much as you can see what's there. You have it audited. You do what's right. You can show the veracity of the currency. He says, yeah, that's, a, that's, that's, that's an interesting idea that they may do that. But he said, here's what I think they'll do. Now, remember, this is a guy that was employed by the CIA to run simulated war games, financial. And he said, what I think the BRICS will do is they will peg every new BRIC currency unit, call it a BRIC, to the dollar price of an ounce of gold. He says, if they do that, they don't need to do anything. The West will destroy themselves. 
And I said, what do you mean by that? He says, well, look, you know, you got all this debt. You got a $32 trillion debt, which ignores the elephant in the room. And that's the Medicare, Medicaid, Social Security, government, military pensions. We have $155 trillion in debt, Jesse. By the way, we only have $5 trillion in assets, of which the largest asset of this country is student debt. As nauseating as that is, it represents over 40% of our asset base. You take that out of the equation, we have $3.5 trillion in assets backing $155 trillion in, in debt. We are a banana republic. But at least we don't jail our political opposition, right? I digress. Anyway, so um, he says... If the U.S. has to inflate in order to pay uh, or to meet their obligations, both funded and unfunded, in an environment where the big buyers of U.S. treasuries, Japan and China and Saudi Arabia, are dumping them. We are to believe right now that the Cayman Islands is the second or third largest buyer of U.S. treasuries. Do we really believe that? Or is that the Fed hiding behind a, a shell company? I don't know. I don't think the Cayman Islands is buying that many treasuries, but that's what we're led to believe. So in any case, what does that mean? That means if we want to continue to, to uh, make good on our obligations to the world and to the American public in Social Security, in Medicare, in Medicaid, in government military pensions, and all of the litany of other entitlements, not to mention all of the obligations we have on balance sheet, we have no choice but to inflate. It's inflate or default. And so if they inflate, the dollar goes down, gold goes up, the bricks win. And if they want to accumulate gold to compete with the bricks, the dollar goes down, gold goes up, the bricks win. I do believe that we will see a commodity-backed currency that is issued by the bricks. I do believe we will see a unification of the Shanghai Cooperation Organization, the Eurasian Economic Union, the BRICS, and almost certainly the Belt Road Initiative. You put all these countries together, you're talking 90% of human population. That is not going green, and we are. And, you know, one last piece that I'd like to talk about regarding the BRICS. I um, get a lot of pushback from people about one thing, and only one thing, really, about this, and that is, well, China and India don't like each other. How are you going to do that? How is this going to work if China... And India don't like each other. I want to read something to you that most people don't know. Uh, Chinese President Xi Jinping and Indian Prime Minister Modi agreed last week to seek a resolution to years of tensions along the Himalayan border area. Uh, Xi Jinping and Modi had spoken on the sidelines at the BRICS summit in Johannesburg. Modi highlighted India's concerns about the unresolved issues along the line of actual control, LAC, which serves as the effective India-China border. The two leaders agreed to direct the relevant officials to intensify efforts at expeditious disengagement and de-escalation. Huh. Well, there you go. So when you talk about these things that people throw up as roadblocks, look at what China is doing. They are going in under mutual cooperation and benefit. They've, they've struck peace deals between Sunni and Shiite, between Iran and Saudi Arabia, countries that have hated each other, that are now building embassies in each other's countries and are now are part of the new recently formed BRICS Naval Alliance. You have China or China brokering a peace deal between Iran and Iraq, two countries that don't like each other, built the first ever rail, railway between the two countries. You have them going into all of these developing um, industrial uh, developing nations and trying to industrialize them, building railways and bridges and maritime channels and oil refineries and gold and silver mines and allowing them to industrialize their, their economy, their country, and find a better way of life through cooperation. And the last thing I'm going to say about the BRICS, because I think it's really very important, is to talk for a moment about our allies. And, you know, and not to mention real quick, I guess there's two. I lied. There's two other things. That's just real quick. For those who aren't aware, the six countries that joined were Saudi Arabia, Iran, the United Arab Emirates, Egypt, uh, Ethiopia uh, and, what, and Argentina. And so let's just talk about that for one second. So with Saudi Arabia, Iran and the United Arab Emirates, you have three of the largest oil producers in the world. In Argentina, you have a major agricultural producer. Plus, most people don't know this, the largest 
producer of, of natural gas in all of South America. And Egypt controls the Suez Canal and Ethiopia is the fastest growing economy in Africa. So you have all of this, you know, you have, uh, what, 40, 50 percent of, of, of the world's population just in the bricks right here. Right now, you have almost 50 percent of the oil production. You have 75 percent of the world's manganese, 10 percent of the copper, 28 percent of the nickel, 50 percent of the graphite. The list goes on and on and on and on. So far, there have been 23 more countries that have formally, formally submitted their applications to join BRICS in the next meeting, another 22 that have expressed interest, 50 more countries. Little by little by little by little, bang, all at once. The game Jenga comes to mind. Little by little by little by little, boom, the whole thing falls over. Where are we on this path? So the last thing I want to talk about, as I mentioned, is France. And, you know, Macron was right there with us. When we signed the uh, the um, sanction against uh, against Russia, right? And so, what is what have they done since then? You know, so since then they've done quite a bit. As a matter of fact, you had you had Macron go to Xi Jinping before the meeting and signed a fifty point treaty, a trade trade agreement treaty with China, ranging from five G to military engagement. You had uh, Macron come out and say that the war in the Ukraine is not their problem. They want nothing to do with it, backing away from it. Actually asked to be invited to the BRICS meeting and was turned down. But the point is that he asked to go there, did a massive liquid natural gas deal with United Arab Emirates, Emirates and paid for it in, um, in, in, in Yuan. So as you can see, even our friends are exiting stage left. And when you see this kind of stuff happen, um, the, the, the sides being chosen, the United Arab Emirates, Western Ally, uh, Saudi Arabia, Turkey, um, uh, Mexico, France. I mean, all of these countries are choosing sides. And so when you talk about what did and what didn't come out of it, this country has grown too obsessed with instant gratification. This is a, a, a methodical process that don't wish for it to accelerate because when it does, there's going to be great ramifications to the dollar and the way things happen in this country. So it's just more of the same thing, like I said at the onset of this interview. These countries think in terms of years and decades and centuries, and we think in terms of seconds and minutes. And those who are positioning the way they are building their master chessboard are, are, are forming one hell of an alliance, two of the three largest nuclear arsenals in the world, the majority of all the natural resources in the world, uh, and the majority of human population in the world. So is it a big deal? You bet your ass it's a big deal. Did it happen where fireworks went off? No. But take a step back and look at the Jenga board one by one by one by one or the logarithmic decay. Where are we? How far up the, the, the river is the falls? That's yet to be determined, but I don't think we've gotten off the river. I'll put it to you that way. So I wanted to shift focus to talking about gold and interest rates because you mentioned a lot of gold bugs are disappointed. And that's kind of surprising when we look at how quickly the Fed has hiked interest rates and how well the gold price is holding up. Um, I spoke to Michael Pento recently, and as he discussed on the show, gold performs best when rates are falling. So firstly, do you see central banks being forced to cut rates up ahead um, if something else breaks, another banking crisis? Uh, and how do you expect gold to respond in that scenario? First of all, Michael Pento, to me, is one of the great minds in this industry. I'd love to sit and have a beer or two with him. I watch him all the time on Liberty and Finance. And if you're watching, Michael, you have my great respect and admiration. He's right. There's a term in economics called Gibson's Paradox, which speaks to the inverse relationship between the price of gold and real interest rates. Real. And for those that don't understand the difference between real and nominal, Nominal interest rates are the price we see quoted, let's say, on the 10-year treasury. Let's say that's at 4.5%. That's the nominal rate. Subtract inflation away from the nominal rate and you get the real rate. Now, problem is the CP lie that the, uh, that the Fed gives us is really not right, or the Bureau of Labor Statistics, it's not right. 
it, it strips out so many of the things that should be in it. If you are, are if you believe that inflation is only three percent, you know I got a bridge to sell you. Look at how expensive things are getting, and that's where John Williams of Shadow Stats comes in and tells us the way that inflation used to be calculated. If they hadn't changed it, it would be two, three times what it truly is. But to his point, what he's getting at is true because, look, if you can earn 10%, there's the, in, in math, there's something called the rule of 70 seconds. You take the interest rate, divide it into 72, it tells you how long before your principal doubles. If you can get 10% in a treasury in 7.2 years, your principal doubles. Why the hell would you buy gold? If in a stable environment, you can double your money every seven years or buy an asset that earns no, pays no yield, has no interest attached to it. So that's the inverse relationship between the two. Now, I'm going to answer your questions in two ways. Do I think that the uh, governments will be forced to pivot? Well, that's what the bond traders will tell you. That's why you see an inverted yield curve. The inversion of the yield curve, maybe the most inverted it's ever been or for the longest period of time, Number one, it always precedes a every every single inverted yield curve since 1950 has preceded a massive or at least a recession. This would be a massive one based upon the length and the and the depth of the inversion. Uh, and and so, but it also, you know, basically what it's saying is that we'll pay you more money for a three month or a two year treasury than we will for a ten year treasury. Because they're saying that as we get further down the line, that the Fed will have to pivot. They will have to lower rates again because the economy will break. That's the conventional wisdom. Um, a lot of what I've talked about with you and others, it talks about that moment when the world no longer takes dollars um, for oil. Maybe it's somewhere down the road. All the members of, of OPEC on the all of them on the Belt Road Initiative, and now safety in numbers in this ever-growing group of countries that present a very formidable foe, in, in particular militarily, um, say, we're not taking dollars for oil anymore. And, and, and why? Because you guys signed an executive order, you idiots. You signed an executive order right when the current administration came into office saying, we're going green by 2030, 80% by 2050, 50 by 2030. So with respect, we are now going to associate with the countries that represent close to 90% of the world that aren't going green. And that's why we've joined the, these countries. And that's why you could argue the petrodollar is already dead because you're seeing agreements being struck with like China, for example, or Saudi Arabia selling oil for you want, and then they can immediately convert it into gold on the Shanghai gold exchange. So here's the thing. If the country was stable and the, and everything got back to normal again and you saw interest rates where they are right now or escalating even higher, yeah, gold's in trouble because you can earn, you know, in a three-month treasury right now, 5.5%. By the way, when you talk about how fast it's gone up, the beginning of 2022, that three-month treasury was 0.06%. Now it's about 5.5%. The, 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 the speed at which they raised interest rates is nefarious. And you wonder if there's something more behind it. I do. And we can talk about that as we go along, but still hasn't gone up high enough to make the return on these investments anything other than zero, maybe very slightly positive using their BS inflation numbers. The real inflation numbers were still negative. But here's the point. The question becomes, how bad does it get? In my mind's eye, I see a period of time where these countries say we're not taking dollars for oil anymore. And you have to understand, and maybe that doesn't happen for a while, and maybe they don't say we're not taking dollars, but we're taking other currencies too. And I say that because it's the synthetic demand that has been created out of our protection of the Saudi kingdom for 50 years. The agreement is OPEC will value oil in dollars, and then we'll take the proceeds and re recycle them into U.S. treasuries. Well, what did I tell you about Saudi Arabia, they're at their lowest level in the last six years in terms of treasury holdings. They're selling them. Coincidentally, they're also at the lowest amount of oil that they're pumping to the United States, to the West, in six years also. Both are happening at the same time. But what if they said that? Every country on the planet has had to stockpile dollars for 50 years to buy oil. So is it out of the question to think that all of these countries that are joining together against the Western hegemony, 
all of the OPEC countries that are on the Belt Road, all of these new Iran, UAE, Saudi Arabia, are you kidding me? You're talking 50% of the world's oil right there. And then you got Russia on top of it, the second largest oil producer in the world. Do you see a trend? where all of these countries are moving away from the West and they're self-sufficient as it comes to energy and natural resources. U.S. is going green. They're going to inflate to, to continue to meet these obligations that they've, they've, they've become a banana republic. And what happens when they say, we're taking other currencies? And every one of these countries dumped dollars. Now... I don't care what the Fed wants to do. If half the world dumps dollars simultaneously because they no longer need to hold them, and many of them don't like the U.S., it would be their way of saying, you know, doing this to the U.S., we don't like you anyway, here's your dollars back. The byproduct of that tsunami of inflation is massively spiked interest rates that the Fed can't control. The Fed can't go in and buy the back end of the bond to that degree without destroying the currency. And so when that happens, interest rates spike to the moon. And in that environment, if you follow Michael's logic, then gold would get hammered, except it's not interest rates that are spiking for any other reason except the dollar is being forsaken globally. So who the hell wants a 20% U.S. Treasury in a, in a currency that's dying? Yeah, you, it's like buying you know, a, a, a bond in Weimar Republic, Germany, paying 50% when the currency is dropping by hundreds of percent. So the point of it is, is that I may be a little bit dramatic, but what I'm saying is this time, I think it'll be a little bit different. Yes, to his point, in a rising real interest rate environment, gold would do poorly. But think of what happens if rates go high enough. What happens to the economy? Stocks, bonds, and real estate collapse. And all of these asset prices have been blown sky high due to years of suppressed interest rates and, and four years worth of money creation that was greater than the history of the United States preceding it. And so those asset prices, which have been distorted massively, real estate, stocks, and bonds, in a rising interest rate environment, cross the line of, of, of it being a, a religious experience. So, yes, that is why the bond market says they will have to pivot and, and lower rates again. But when they do that, what are they saying to the world? We give up. We give up. We'll never normalize our balance sheet. We're sorry. We're going to inflate our way out of this problem. Do you realize, Jesse, that a trillion seconds ago was 31,688 years ago? So how in God's green earth do we pay off $155 trillion in, in um, obligations with only $3.5 trillion in assets? Take student debt out of it. Now you got $5 trillion, put it back in. In a country that's no longer produces much of anything at all, and more importantly, since we're at this point, and I know you didn't ask me, but I have to say it, what makes the dollar the dollar and all of this factors into gold? There are three things in my opinion. One, the petrodollar. Well, we saw what's happened there. Two, the full faith and three, credit of the United States. Full faith and credit. Well, let's look at number three, credit. What happened? Uh, 2022 balance sheet. 155 trillion in debt, 5 trillion in assets, 125% debt to GDP. We are a banana republic. We're insolvent. We're broke. Take away the printing press. We're dead. So we're not really in terms of credit worthiness. Look at, look at what Moody's did. Downgraded the U.S. debt. And they should have done it a long time ago and should have done it more. If it was another country, it would have been downgraded exponentially more and a lot long, longer ago. And then how about the faith? People walk across Central America and Mexico to get to the United States, risking everything for liberty and justice. Um, sail across the, the uh, you know, the Atlantic Ocean from Cuba on, on inner tubes tied with strings to find freedom, to leave an author authoritarian regime for liberty and justice. And I, again, I'm going to say this. I've said it in every interview I've done this week. This is not a, a political statement. I am a, a, not a Republican. I'm not a Democrat. I think they all stink. I am a libertarian. I am a, a patriot. I am someone who comes from nothing, who built a company from a loan from my dad's best friend, whose middle name is Franklin, and recently eclipsed $9 billion in sales without a customer complaint because of the wonderful opportunities the United States has afforded me and my family. Hard work, stick to keep your nose clean, and you can do anything you can dream of. 
I never would have dreamt I would have got to where I am. And I thank God every day for this country. But look at what's happened to it. The, the, the unification of this country is being ripped apart. After World War II and the Great Depression, we were a unified country who believed in God, in the nuclear family. We respected uh, law. Uh, we respected our family and our elders. Look at the lawlessness in this country. Look at the obsession with transgenderism and cancel culture and censorship. And I don't care how much you hate President Trump or how much you hate President Biden. What is happening to these two entities, if you look at it from an impartial lens, if anyone can tell me that they think the law is being administered equally, you know, I disagree. But I don't think anyone being honest with themselves would say that. And when you look at this from a broader perspective at all, all of it is part of the, the big picture. The petrodollar is dying. You might argue it's already dead based upon the relationship and the agreement we had, which is now null and void based upon what Saudi Arabia is doing. You can talk about the faith and credit of this country. Well, we just did. They're broke, they're insolvent, and the, the faith is not lost on our allies and our folks who are saying, what the hell is happening in the United States? This is a country that was the beacon of light and liberty and justice, and it ain't anymore. And that, to me, is more disheartening than anything. And I'll put a bow around all of this and say, do you know that the lead economic advisor to the United States government, <laughs> to the Biden administration, ironically, is a man named Jared Bernstein, whose entire thesis is to lose the dollar's world reserve status. In fact, he wrote a report that was picked up by the New York Times and another that was picked up by the Washington Post. The famous one is Dethrone King Dollar, in which he advocates for the immediate removal of the U.S. world reserve currency, that it is an exorbitant privilege we can no longer afford, and that it creates distortions and imbalances in trade. Now, if you wanted to destroy the dollar's world reserve status, what would you do? Well, first, you'd weaponize the dollar and make everyone think, hmm, are we next? Because we look what they did. They just confiscated Russia's forex assets and, and used it to rebuild the Ukraine. We didn't just sanction, we confiscated. And that's not the responsibility of the world reserve currency at all. It shouldn't be, but it was. We're hypocritical. Look at the difference between Iraq and Russia. I mean, we go in and destroy Iraq, don't find the weapons and say, we're sorry, no big deal. But Russia defends their sovereignty. Whether you're right, whether you feel Putin's right or wrong, that's not what this is about. This isn't a, a statement on war. This is the way the world looks at us. So we, we first thing you do, weaponize the dollar, make everyone freaked out. Then you tell the linchpin of the dollar hegemony, hey, thanks, but we're going green. In fact, we just signed an executive order to that degree. And then you destroy the unity in the country. The, the black versus white, red versus blue, rich versus poor, vaccine, no vaccine. And you see a world where, where you know, you could argue that our foes making these moves is completely logical based upon what they see happening around the world. And that's exactly what Biden's chief economic advisor would want. So... You know, what do I think about all of this stuff, Jesse? Gold and silver are going to go higher than anyone thinks possible at some point because the dollar in which we measure it against is in, inordinately strong, so much so that on Monday of this week, a couple days ago, gold hit all-time highs against the second and third largest economies of the world, that being China and Japan. You look at a chart of the 30 largest economies in the, of the world and gold is at or near all-time highs in every one of them. What does that tell you? Gold's doing its job around the world. It's the inordinate, unjustified, manipulated BS strength of a dollar that is broke in a country that is disunified and upside down from what it once was. And I hope to God we find our way back. But that strength of the dollar is unjustified. And there will come a time, I believe, when the rest of the world finds a new alternative and pushes back against it. And that moment, when that moment happens, and interest rates spike to the moon. This is the one time where what Michael is talking about would not play true because it would come at the heels of a dollar that is getting clobbered. If interest rates are strong in a stable currency, there's no need for gold. You can make a nice return and double your money in a, in a, in a, in a nice period of time without you know, holding an asset that doesn't pay any return. But in an environment we find ourselves in where there is chaos everywhere, and we haven't even begun to see how it all plays out, then, yeah, I, I, I don't think that the rising interest rates that we've seen 
will have any impact on gold. And maybe that's why the central banks, the ones holding it up by buying more than they have any time in the history of the central banking, realize that it doesn't matter. Any of None of this matters if it plays out the way that we're talking about here. Well, Andy, that's a great note to end it on. Thank you so much for joining us today. And thanks to all of you for tuning in. But we're not done yet. We will be back with part two to talk about silver, bank bail-ins, bank account, uh, banks closing coin shops accounts, what's behind that, and much more. So stay tuned for part two. Commodity Culture is a series on commodities and natural resources. If you would like to see more, be sure to subscribe and hit the bell notification so you're always up to date with the latest episodes.